Ever wondered how The Sopranos could have been totally different? Imagine Uncle Junior played by Frank Vincent or Tony Soprano played by Ray Liotta. Sounds crazy, right? But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Watch till the end to discover the five actors who almost played Tony Soprano instead of James Gandolfini. You won't believe who nearly took the role. And if you haven't subscribed yet, now's the perfect time. So, you know Uncle Junior, right? That sarcastic old mobster who always had a smart remark up his sleeve? Well, believe it or not, Uncle Junior was almost played by other actors. Yeah, Tony Sirico and Frank Vincent both auditioned for the role. Can you imagine? Picture Polly Walnuts delivering Junior's lines. Forget about it. Luckily for us, the role ultimately went to Dominic Chianese. You hear about the Chinese godfather? He made them an offer they couldn't understand. And thank goodness it did, because could you really see anyone else bringing that unique blend of dry humor and ruthless cunning to the character? It's funny to think about how close we came to a different Uncle Junior. But hey, things worked out perfectly in the end. Sirico and Vincent nailed their roles as Polly Walnuts and Phil Leotardo, respectively, and we wouldn't have it any other way. Each actor brought something so distinctive to their characters that imagining them in different roles is like picturing someone else in Tony's shoes. Not gonna happen. I'm the motherfucking fucking one who calls the shots. Let's talk about Paul Schultze for a second. You probably remember him as Father Phil, the priest who was way too comfortable around Carmela. But did you know he originally auditioned for a completely different role? That's right. Paul first tried out for Mikey, Junior's right-hand man. Hey, Mikey, that's the boy. What boy is that, Tom? The one you sleep with. Oh. Now, Schultz has got this interesting backstory. His dad was a Lutheran pastor in New York City, but Schultz had been playing gritty, tough guys for years. So he thought, yeah, I can totally do this mobster thing. But David Chase, the mastermind behind The Sopranos, had other plans. He asked Schultz to read for Father Phil instead, and the rest is history. Can you imagine Father Phil delivering those cold-blooded lines from Mikey? Me neither. It's crazy how one casting decision can change everything. Schultze ended up making Father Phil a memorable part of The Sopranos world. And even though he only appeared in 13 episodes, he left quite an impression, especially in that episode, College. Now let's talk about Max Casella, the guy who eventually became Benny Fazio. Before he got to wear Benny's shoes, though, Casella went through a bit of a casting roller coaster. He auditioned for not one, not two, but three different roles before finally landing Benny in season three. First, he tried out for Matt Bevilacqua and Sean Gismonte in season two, but things didn't exactly go smoothly. According to Casella, the audition process was, and I quote, a nightmare. He felt like David Chase wasn't giving him any love at all. He even went for the role of Jackie Jr., but that gig went to Jason Serbone instead. By the time he auditioned for Benny, Casella was convinced they were just calling him back because he was pals with one of the writers. But hey, surprise, surprise, they cast him anyway. Even after shooting his first episode, Casella still felt like he didn't quite belong among all the real-deal New Yorkers and Jersey Italians. Despite his doubts, the producers saw something in him, and Benny Fazio ended up sticking around until the very end of the series. Here's a twist for you. Sharipa originally auditioned to play an FBI agent, Skip Lapari. Yeah, I know, hard to picture him as anything other than Bobby, right? But back in the late 90s, Sharipa was just starting to dip his toes into the acting world. He was working as an entertainment director in Vegas when he flew to New York for a wedding and ended up reading for this FBI role. The casting folks? They weren't feeling it. But on a whim, they had him read for Bobby instead. A week later, Sharipa found himself in front of David Chase, and the rest is Sopranos history. But here's the kicker. His first season on the show, he made 24000 and spent twenty three grand just to be there. The guy was literally couch surfing in Brooklyn and flying back and forth to Vegas to keep his day job. It's like a double life Jimmy Altieri would be proud of. Sharipa didn't even tell his Vegas boss he was moonlighting on The Sopranos. And look how it turned out. Bobby became one of the most beloved characters on the show. Quasimodo predicted all this. Now let's talk about Ralph Cifaretto, that guy who just couldn't help but stir up trouble wherever he went. Joe Pantoliano, who played Ralphie, somehow made us almost like him, even when he was doing some pretty heinous stuff. But did you know Ralphie was nearly played by someone else? Robert Funaro, who we later saw as Eugene Ponacorvo, actually landed the Ralphie gig first. On the Talking Sopranos podcast, Funaro shared how he got the role, signed the contract, the whole nine yards. But when he hit the set, the vibe with James Gandolfini just wasn't clicking. Even after dyeing his hair white, the chemistry wasn't there, and David Chase wasn't feeling it. 
Instead of getting the boot, though, Funaro got a lifeline. Chase and Gandolfini didn't want to lose him, so they crafted the Eugene character just for him. Funaro admits it was tough losing the Ralphie role, but sticking it out paid off big time. He ended up with a memorable storyline in Season 6, a tight-knit crew of friends, and a great Sopranos legacy. Not bad for a guy who almost didn't make the cut. Well, you ought to know, sweetie. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> What'd you say? Now, let's talk about Janice Soprano. You know, that character we all love to hate. Before Ada Turturro made Janice her own, the role was still up for grabs, and guess what? Annabella Shora, who later played Gloria, revealed that David Chase originally wanted her to play Janice, but she turned it down. Why? Well, Chase wanted her to wear age makeup and dye her hair because at the time, Janice was supposed to be much older than Tony. Shiora wasn't feeling it and passed on the role. Looking back, she admitted it was probably not her brightest move. Classic Janice, right? But hey, everything worked out in the end. Terturo brought a level of complexity. And let's face it, pure chaos to Janice that made her one of the most memorable characters on the show. And Shiora still got to make her mark as Gloria a character who's still hanging around. Sometimes, things just have a way of working out the way they're supposed to, even in the world of The Sopranos. The fuck out of here. I'm in no mood for you. Here's a fun little backstory about how Lorraine Bracco ended up as Dr. Melfi instead of Carmela Soprano. Picture this. HBO and David Chase are on the hunt for the perfect Carmela, and they reach out to Bracco's agent. But Bracco? She's not having it. She flat out refused to audition for Carmela. For her, it was Dr. Melfi or nothing. Why, you ask? Well, after Goodfellas, Bracco was sick of being typecast as the mafia wife. She told Vanity Fair she was done playing that role. So, when it came time to talk The Sopranos, Bracco's agent told Chase she's coming in for Melfi. Now, that was no easy task for Bracco. She's more Karen Hill than Jennifer Melfi in real life. Imagine trying to suppress all that fire to play the calm, controlled Dr. Melfi. Bracco even said she had to suck the life out of herself to play the role. But hey, it worked out, right? Bracco nailed Melfi, and Edie Falco crushed it as Carmella, snagging three Golden Globes and three Emmys in the process. How the fuck am I supposed to trust you? You're my doctor. Please sit down, you're scaring me. Before Ray Abruzzo became our beloved little Carmine on The Sopranos, he was already hustling in Hollywood. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. Abruzzo initially auditioned for another role on the show, the intervention leader in that classic scene where Adriana's dog becomes an unfortunate casualty. She must have crawled under there for warmth. But missed out. A couple of weeks later, Abruzzo got another shot, but it wasn't looking promising. He was called in to read for Little Carmine, a role described as upwards of 350 LEBs, sweating profusely. Not exactly a perfect match, but Ray took a shot in true Little Carmine style. He threw in some creative mispronunciations like Versailles instead of Versailles, and it paid off big time. So next time you're watching Little Carmine mix up his words on screen, remember, it's all thanks to Ray's quick thinking and a little Hollywood luck. You're at the precipice, Tony, of an enormous crossroad. You know the actress Catherine Narducci? Well, she almost skipped the whole thing because she thought The Sopranos was about, wait for it, opera singers. Can you imagine Tony belting out Arius instead of breaking kneecaps? Shut the door! <laughs> Narducci first heard about the show from Kathy Moriarty. You might remember her as De Niro's wife in Raging Bull. Moriarty was all like, Narducci, there's this show called The Sopranos, and it's going to be big. You should totally check it out. So she got her agent on the case and landed an audition with none other than David Chase and a whole squad of producers. She originally read for Carmela, but of course, Edie Falco nailed that role. Still, the casting director gave Narducci some good news. They loved her and wanted her on the show for another role. But here's the kicker. Narducci was more nervous auditioning for The Sopranos than she was when she worked with De Niro on A Bronx Tale. But hey, she crushed it and ended up bringing that no-nonsense, take-no-prisoners energy to Charmaine that we all love. Two guys over there at that table? Yeah. I think they're FBI. You know Frankie Valli, right? The legendary voice of the Four Seasons? Well, he almost ended up playing Beansy on The Sopranos. On the Talking Sopranos podcast, Frankie spilled the beans on how he landed the role of Rusty Milio. Originally, Frankie auditioned for Beansy, but David Chase told him, I like you, but I'll find something else for you. Now, Frankie thought Chase was just being nice, but guess what? A year and a half later, Chase actually came through. Sort of. 
Frankie got a call about another role, but just as he was getting ready to head to the set, they canceled it. Finally, they gave him the role of Rusty Milio. While Beansy was a bit rough around the edges, David Chase wanted to protect Frankie's image. So instead, he became Rusty, the mobster who got called the mayor of Munchkinland. Not the best nickname, but hey, Rusty had a solid run before meeting his end in Luxury Lounge. So, even though it took a while, Frankie Valli still made his mark on The Sopranos. Eastern Parkway, not the Belt Parkway. Like a lot of actors, Matt Del Negro had a rough start in his career, hustling for gigs wherever he could find them. His first big break came in the North End back in 97, sharing the screen with the Shah of Iran. He was all set to work with Vincent again, but the new casting director had other plans, and Del Negro was out. Fast forward a bit, and that very same casting director was now working on The Sopranos with David Chase. Matt admitted on Talking Sopranos that he held a grudge against Walken for a couple of years, saying, I was like, f*** her. But hey, this is The Sopranos we're talking about. Grudges don't get you far in this world. So Del Negro let it go, and the casting director ended up calling him in to audition for several parts, including Christopher's cousin in D-Girl. Hey, easy, man. <laughs> He didn't land any of those roles, and looking back, he's glad he didn't. Because it led to the role of Carmela's cousin, Brian Camerata, a part that spanned multiple episodes and truly put Del Negro on the map. As he put it, landing that role was the biggest get of his life. So get this. David Chase, the mastermind behind The Sopranos, originally had an Aussie in mind for Tony Soprano. Yep, Anthony LaPaglia. You might know him as Jack Malone from Without a Trace. When LaPaglia got his hands on the pilot script, he was hooked and even met up with Chase to discuss the role. They were ready to roll, but then things got, well, a little complicated. LaPaglia had his own spin on Tony, less Gabagool and more I don't know Shakespeare. In the end, he chose to do a play instead. Chase later mentioned that LaPaglia was considered for a different role in a movie subplot that never saw the light of day. Imagine The Sopranos with an Australian Tony. Bet you'd be ordering shrimp on the Barbie instead of baked ziti. Oh! Next up, we've got Ray Liotta, famous for his central role as Henry Hill in Goodfellas. Now, there's this widespread belief that he was offered the role of Tony in The Sopranos. However, this is actually more of a misunderstanding. The truth is that he was offered a role in the series, but it was actually Ralph Cifaretto, not Tony Soprano. Liotta turned it down because he didn't want to repeat himself with another mafia role, and plus, he was busy with Hannibal at the time. But hey, Liotta eventually found his way into the Sopranos universe with a role in The Many Saints of Newark. So I guess it all came full circle in the end. Get the fuck out of here, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> I almost had him! I almost had him! All right, now here's a fun tidbit for you. You know John Ventimiglia, the guy who played Artie Bucco, Tony's childhood buddy, and your favorite Italian chef? Well, he actually auditioned to be the boss himself, Tony Soprano, and even tried out for Polly Walnuts. But while he didn't end up cracking those roles, the producers clearly saw something they liked and gave him the part of Artie, which, let's be honest, turned out to be perfect for him. Now, get this. Gandolfini didn't just outshine Ventimiglia in the Sopranos auditions. Nope. They both went head-to-head -head for roles in The Juror and a Broadway production of A Streetcar Named Desire. And guess who won those two? So poor Ventimiglia was always a step behind, but hey, at least he got to serve pasta to the mob, right? It's like a martini, but it's from Albania. I never heard of it. Well, apparently they go down real easy. Now picture this, Michael Rispoli, one of the final three guys up for the role of Tony Soprano. In a chat on the Talking Sopranos podcast, Rispoli spilled the beans about his wild audition experience. His manager kept getting these mixed signals. One minute, Rispoli's the favorite, the next, it's Gandolfini. Eventually, they gave the nod to Gandolfini, and honestly, Rispoli couldn't even be mad about it. Like Ventimiglia said, Gandolfini was just too nice to hold a grudge against. But losing out on Tony wasn't the end for Rispoli. Far from it. He ended up landing the role of Jackie April, who pops up in the first season. So, yeah, Rispoli might not have been Tony, but he's still got to be a part of the family, and in the world of The Sopranos, that's not too shabby, right? Sit down. Finally, here's a wild one for you. Steven Van Zandt, the guitar-slinging legend from Bruce Springsteen's band, almost became Tony Soprano. Crazy, right? At the time, Stevie had zero acting experience, but David Chase wanted fresh faces, so he was in the mix. But, you know, no experience meant no dice for the big boss role. But here's where it gets interesting. Van Zandt actually had a hand in casting James Gandolfini. He spotted Gandolfini and was like, 
Hey, this guy was a killer in true romance. He's the one. Imagine Van Zandt's Tony Soprano. A little more humor, a lot less menace. Would have been a totally different show. But instead, Stevie ends up as Silvio Dante, Tony's consigliere. A pretty sweet gig for a guy who'd never acted before. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Who knew casting The Sopranos could have gone in so many different directions? It's crazy to think how close we came to having an entirely different show, but in the end, everything worked out the way it was meant to. So next time you're watching The Sopranos, take a moment to appreciate all the actors who almost played a different role. If you enjoyed this video, hit that like button and subscribe for more deep dives into the world of The Sopranos. Thanks for watching, and as always, stay safe out there.